بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا دكتور علي في رمضان مدرس طب الأطفال وأعصاب الأطفال مستشفى بريش جامعة القاهرة It's an honor to be with you today for brief discussion of the clinical approach to a case of seizures in pediatrics First of all, what is the definition of seizure? Seizure is a transient occurrence of signs and or symptoms resulting from abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. It may be manifested as loss of consciousness, abnormal motor activity, sensory disturbances, or autonomic dysfunction. The term seizure is often used interchangeably with convulsions. But epilepsy usually requires the occurrence of at least one unprovoked epileptic seizure with either a second such seizure or enough EEG and the clinical information to convincingly demonstrate an enduring predisposition to develop recurrences. For epidemiologic and commonly for clinical purposes, epilepsy is considered to be present when two or more unprovoked seizure occur in a time frame of longer than 24 hours. Febrile seizures are seizures that occur between the age of 6 months and 60 months with a temperature of 38 Celsius or higher that are not the result of CNS infection or any metabolic imbalance and occur in the absence of a history of a prior febrile seizures. Febrile seizures are classified into simple febrile seizures and complex febrile seizures. Simple febrile seizures is a primary generalized, usually tonic-clonic, attack associated with fever, lasting for a maximum of 15 minutes and not recurrent within a 24-hour period. While complex febrile seizure is a more prolonged attack, that may be focal and may recur within a 24-hour period. According to the International League Against Epilepsy, seizure types are classified into focal, generalized, or unknown, and epilepsy types are classified into focal, generalized, combined generalized and focal, and unknown with epilepsy syndromes. Different etiologies are proposed for seizures and include genetic causes, structural causes as stroke, metabolic disorders, immune causes, infections, and could be unknown. To classify seizures, examples of generalized seizures include absence attacks, which are planking out or staring into space for a few seconds, myoclonic seizure, which is a shock-like contraction of muscle of less than 50 milliseconds that's often repeated, clonic seizures consist of rhythmic fast muscle contractions and slightly longer relaxations, tonic seizures are characterized by increased tone and or rigidity, tonic-clonic seizures which involve clonic and tonic features. Atonic seizures, or what we call the drop attacks, are characterized by flaccidity or lack of movement during a convulsion. While focal or partial seizures are further categorized as either simple partial seizures, which is localized to an area of one side of the brain, but may spread to other areas, and consciousness is maintained. Complex partial seizures, seizures originating in one area of the brain, but affect the conscious level. While partial seizures that the secondary generalizes are partial seizures that may spread to other areas of the brain. Common causes of seizures, according to different age group in pediatrics, in newborn age group, common causes of seizures include brain malformations, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, 
electrolyte disturbances including hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, and hypomagnesemia, inborn errors of metabolism, intracranial hemorrhages, maternal drug use, and CMS infection. While in infants and younger children, common causes of seizures include fever, which include febrile seizures, brain tumor, CMS infections, inborn errors of metabolism, and hypertension. In older children and adults, causes of seizures include congenital conditions as tuberous sclerosis and neurofibromatosis, genetic factors, neurodegenerative diseases, and head trauma. When trying to approach a case of seizure, we have to start with history. For illustration of the type, duration of seizure, and the post-ectal period, the frequency of recurrence of seizures, the age of the first attack, association with fever or not, history of trauma or signs of increased intracranial tension, developmental milestones, consanguinity, family history of seizures. Examination include full detailed general examination, neurological examination, and check on other systems for any signs or manifestations of toxemia or CNS infection and other a feature of other system disorder as uremia, for example. Investigation-wise, we start with the lab investigations, imaging may be needed, and EEG. This yes. details in such a presentation and such case, such a slide will be discussed in the next one. So this is the master slide of this presentation. If you are confronted with a child who have seizures or presumed history of seizures, first of all, you have to make sure that your child has actual or true seizures, because we have many conditions that are called epilepsy mimics, which are rather benign conditions, but share one or more features of epilepsy or seizures which could be disturbed conscious level, abnormal posturing, or cyanosis, but all of them does not fulfill the full clinical criteria of seizures. Examples of epilepsy mimics, benign paroxysmal vertigo, breath holding spells, cough syncope, familial chloroacetosis, hereditary chin trembling, shuddering attacks, night terror, pseudo seizures, rage attack, benign myclonus of infancy, and ticks. All these conditions and others could be mistaken for seizures, and you have to make sure before approaching and labeling your patient as having a seizure that, it's not, that it is not one of the epilepsy mimics. So if we are quite sure that the patient had an attack of seizure, then we have to ask ourselves the first important question. Is it a first seizure or it a recurring seizure? If it is the first attack, we have to check fasting blood sugar, calcium. We may need metabolic studies as needed. We have to revise the history. We will do full physical examination. Other investigations as EEG and the brain imaging could be cho choose according to the clinical scenario. And if there is any risk that there is CNS infection, we will do CSF examination. And according to the, the results of the investigation and examination, we have either abnormal investigation and or examination so it is a symptomatic seizure. We will treat then the underlying cause 
as hypoglycemia, urea cycle abnormalities, meningitis, timber lobe tumors, and whatsoever. And the choice of anti-epileptic and the need to start anti-epileptic will be taken according to the clinical scenario and mostly no need to use anti-epileptics or at least no need to use long-term anti-epileptics. But if the patient has normal examination and basic investigation apart from EEG, so you are confronted with an isolated first seizure with normal EEG, and as we, as we discussed, the patient has negative family history. No continuous drug treatment is needed. We will just do observation and prescribe rescue medication for the family in case of seizure occurred at home. Either erectal diazepam, for example, that can be used directly if the attack lasted for more than five minutes. But if the patient had normal examination except EEG which, which shows abnormal, we may consider starting drug therapy and we will plan for our visit accordingly. If our patient had recurrent seizures, which is not the first attack, so we have to revise the compliance on treatment, the proper dosing, the proper choice of the drug. We have to revise the metabolic disorders and the electrolyte disturbances, especially calcium derangements that happen as a complication of antiepileptics. We have to revise for underlying structural lesion, check for drug interactions. We have to revise your diagnosis for CNS degenerative diseases. And accordingly, we will plan the follow-up visit. If the patient has good control, then a regular follow-up visit with anti-epileptic drug labeling and monitoring of toxicity by CBC, liver function with behavioral learning, and follow-up EEG as needed. If the patient has poor control, we will hospitalize, we will do prolonged EEG, and we will adjust his medications and reconsider underlying pathology and will reinvestigate by, by MRI or CT brain and advise more close frequent follow-up visits. This study demonstrates the commonly used anti-epileptic medications, which include valproic acid, which acts as a sodium channel blocker and used in most types for all types of seizures, it's a broad spectrum anti-epileptics. Levetiracetam, which has unknown or unclear mechanism of action, can be used as a broad spectrum anti-epileptic. Phenytoin and phenoparpetone are used in status epilepticus. Phenoparb also can be used in neonatal seizures. Carbamazepines, which include also oxcarbamazepine, are used mainly for simple partial and complex partial seizures, secondary generalization. If ethoxamide, which is a calcium channel blocker, is used for absence seizure. Tobiramate is used as a broad spectrum antiepileptic. Lamotrigine is used as a broad spectrum antiepileptic. Clonazepam is used for infantile spasms, myoclonic absence and seizures. We mentioned earlier epileptic encephalopathies and we mean by epileptic encephalopathy and epilepsy syndrome in which there is a severe EEG abnormality which is thought to result in cognitive and other impairment in the patient. The main features include electrophysiologic or EEG paroxysmal activity that's often aggressive with high spike rate or paroxysmal discharge density Seizures that are usually multiform and intractable, cognitive and behavioral and neurological deficits, and sometimes early deaths. Examples of epileptic encephalopathy commonly encountered in pediatrics West syndrome, Dravet syndrome, and Lennox Gastro. 
At last, status epilepticus, it is defined as a continuous seizure activity or a recurrent seizure activity without regaining consciousness lasting for more than five minutes. It's a medical emergency that should be anticipated in any patient who presents with an acute seizure. In the past, the cut off time was 30 minutes, but this has been reduced to emphasize the risk involved with the longer durations. Management of status epilepticus includes initial assessment and the stabilization of the patient. Lab studies include serum glucose, serum electrolytes and magnesium and calcium, ABG, complete blood count, urine and blood toxicology, anti-seizure drug levels, other as needed by clinical scenario, which include lumbar puncture, metabolic studies, and neuroimaging. Then we have to stabilize our patient with frequent monitoring. This chart illustrates the stepwise approach for a child presenting with epileptic seizure up to status epilepticus. First phase is the stabilization phase in which seizure is lasting for less than five minutes. First of all, and never forget to check and maintain ABC, saving life first. We have to check and maintain ABC, airway, breathing and circulation. Give high flow oxygen. It's a very important, frequently missed to give the patient high flow oxygen to lessen the risk of the insult. Check blood glucose level. Establish intravenous access. Consider the following electrolytes as we mentioned earlier, CBC, renal function, electrolytes, toxicology screen, and maybe blood culture. And if the patient is on anti-epileptics, consider a drug epileptic, anti-epileptic levels. But if seizure continues more than five minutes, then it is an early status epilepticus, in which seizure can last from five to 30 minutes. We can give either IV lorazepam at a dose 0.1 milligram per kg, slowly IV over two to five minutes, or IV piazepam, slowly IV over two to five minutes. But if you have no IV access, consider either buccal midazolam at a dose 0.5 milligram per kg, or directal diazepam, or IM midazolam at a dose 0.2 milligram per kg. Remember, buccal diazolam is given at a dose 0.5 milligram per kg. I am midazolam is given at a dose 0.2 milligram per kg. Do not give more than two doses of benzodiazepines because if no response to two do 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 doses of benzodiazepine, then we have to shift to more potent IV medications. If seizure continues after two doses of benzodiazepine, then it is an established status epilepticus, and we will start immediately IV phenytoin with loading dose 20 milligram per kg, infused over 20 minutes. You should monitor the patient for cardiac arrhythmias, especially if it is the first time to receive phenytoin and he is not on the regular phenytoin. If seizure continues after administration of phenytoin, we can add either IV phenobarbitone or other alternatives, including IV lipitracetam over 20 minutes or IV valproic acid over 20 minutes. If seizure continues after use of double medications, then it is a refractory status epilepticus. You have to admit the patient to the ICU. We will do rapid sequence intubation. We will start IV midazolam infusion with loading dose of 0.15 mic milligram per kg over two to three minutes, followed by continuous infusion of two mic per kg per minute with up titration to the desirable effect for a maximum of 24 mic per kg per minute. 
If no response or if not available, you can use IV thiovental sodium with loading dose 3 mg per kg over 10 minutes, followed by continuous IV infusion of 3 mg per kg per hour and titrate to the desirable effect of to maximum of 5 mg per kg per hour or IV phenobarbital loading dose 5 mg over 10 minutes followed by continuous IV infusion of 0.5 mg per kg per hour and titrate to the desirable effect. Sometimes we need to commence the patient on general anesthesia to control his seizure condition. Uh, we finished our resume and illustration of management of seizures in pediatrics. Thank you for God blessing.